Good morning everyone. For anyone in the room who doesn't know me, and for the purpose of the video, I'm Rob Fleming, I'm a specialty doctor and anaesthetist here at NUH. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about um, fever safety, which does follow on very nicely from the last talk. So I'm going to talk a bit about the background to my survey, um, and then how I carried out a survey kind of within the Trust First and then regionally. And then I'm going to go off completely at a tangent and talk about roads and railway lines and how they apply to patient safety, and then give you a possible solution to some of the problems and errors that we've been making when using TIVA. Um, so firstly, a bit of background. Um, when I was a novice in Manchester more than a decade ago, I worked at a trust that were fairly early adopters for TIVA, and there were two TIVA pumps in every theatre, two old PK pumps in every single theatre, and they, the, for the first year of my anaesthetic career, half of my logbook was TIVA anaesthetics. And when I was there, I witnessed several errors and then having moved to this region where TIVA was less common and then not used TIVA that much for you know, five or six years and then started using TIVA again, I considered myself very careful. I also considered myself to be someone who error wouldn't happen to me because you know, I'm very, very diligent and cautious and vigilant. And then of course I made an error. And then when I spoke to other people, um, everyone I spoke to who used TIVA said, oh yeah, I've done that. Um, I dated myself and reported it and got an email from Adam saying, don't worry about it. So, Got me thinking, perhaps if the same errors I'm making now are the same errors I witnessed a decade ago, and when you talk to other people that use them, use TIVA, they're making the same errors as well, perhaps we have a bigger problem than we recognise. Um, and perhaps also those Datex reports are just the tip of the iceberg, and they don't represent all of the error that's occurring, they just represent the errors that actually result in something worthy of reporting. Um, at the same time, I'm also aware that NUH are now the single biggest user of users of TIVA in the country. So we buy, according to Mark Barley, we buy more TIVA-specific giving sets than any other trust, any other organisation in the UK, um, ditto Bistrips. So we are probably the single biggest TIVA provider in the UK at the moment. Um, and over the last half a dozen years, a few things that have been published that are relevant. So NAT5 was published in 2014, and then off the back of that, the CIVA and the Association Guideline on the use of TIVA was published in 2019. Um, so... NAP5, I'm not going to cover much of it, but NAP5, as you're all aware, is a national audit project um, looking for cases of accidental awareness under general anaesthesia. And it found that despite the fact that TIVA at that point only made up 8% of anaesthetics in the whole country, it accounted for 18% of cases of accidental awareness that occurred, which is a little worrying. Um, and there was some controversy at the time because some of the techniques that appeared in there were a little interesting. For example, one of the cases of awareness was someone using intermittent boluses of fire pento. Now, I don't think that's something I would consider to be a standard T NUHT of practice. But even if you remove those, the graph in that five would suggest that a TCI propofol based TIVA anaesthetic, as we use when we use SIVA for the most part, um, is still associated with roughly double the risk of awareness compared to, a gem to volatile anaesthesia. But they also said that these things didn't occur where everything went right. Those cases of awareness, one of the key reasons for those cases of awareness was failure to ensure delivery of the intended anaesthetic dose, with the inference being that if we were actually giving what we intended to give, the patient would have been asleep, but something had gone awry. And they gave a big list of things that had actually occurred and other things that they thought could occur. And I'm not going to run through them all, but again, these are the kinds of things that can happen using total intravenous anaesthesia that can't happen <coughs> using volatile anaesthesia. Um, and there was a suggestion from that five that we should make some changes to our practice nationally, but they also recognised that that wasn't necessarily within the remit of the, the eventual product of that five, but that the relevant, relevant organisations and authorities ought to get together to create some kind of guideline for TIVA practice. Um, and it took a little while. Um, but that's exactly what happened. So February this year, um, the association and SIVA um, published a joint guideline for the practice of total intravenous anaesthesia. Um, as far as they're aware, in the blurb at the beginning, it's the first of its kind. So there isn't any other national or international guideline, excuse me, specifically focusing on practice. Um, and it expanded from the recommendations from that five. Um, and it kind of forms the basis of my survey. So, <laughs> My survey design, I was interested in what we're doing, so I was interested to see whether or not we were actually following that guideline, because by the time I started surveying it, it had been out for five or six months. And I think a lot of the things in it are things that I would like to hope a lot of us were doing anyway, but I was interested to see whether there were any things in there that it recommended that we weren't doing. 
I was also interested, because this was the primary reason why I wanted to do this in the first place, as into what errors people were making. Um, and I thought, if you look at the Datix reports, or if I surveyed the regional Datix reports, I'd probably just find the tip of the iceberg. And I imagine the numbers you get would be very reassuring, because they would suggest that while there might be a few clusters, and there might be a few things that recur, probably most of the TV anesthetics aren't being Datix reported, so that's good. <laughs> Um, so I thought I would ask people directly, which of the following errors have you made? Um, and then also ask, what were the consequences? Um, so I surveyed us for a couple of weeks in July, and then I got a fantastic response from here, largely because I was emailing you all every week or so to say, please fill out my survey. Um, and then I surveyed the rest of the region after I closed the survey here um, and got a pretty good response from them as well. So here I got 76 responses with a fairly nice spread, mostly consultants, as you would expect, with a nice spread of trainees and a few, a few SAS doctors. Likewise, in the rest of the region, I got a broadly similar response. So I got 76 from here, and I got 104 responses from the rest of the region. Um, and I got a nice spread from everywhere. So it took a couple of emails going backwards and forwards, but with a bit of prompting, I got responses from everywhere. And the fewest I got, I think, was six. The most I got was about 25. But I got what I hope is a representative sample of what's going on elsewhere. Um, for the purposes of the rest of the presentation, um, NUH is called NUH, and the rest of the East Midlands is called EM. I um, hope that makes sense. Um, so, first question I asked was, when providing general anaesthesia, how often do you use TIVA? And obviously this is self-reported, so people might be incorrect. I'm hoping you get yourself in vaguely the right ballpark. Um, and so you see we've got kind of a bimodal distribution. There is a bit of a spike of dabblers who use it sometimes, and there is a spike of people who use it roughly half the time, give or take. And there's a few enthusiasts and a few slightly less enthusiastic. And you compare that to the rest of the region, and they've got a big spike at some times. And you can see we are far more TIVA friendly at NUH perhaps. Um, and if you analyze it for that a bit better, that would suggest that the average NUH and EASTIS is using TIVA for about 40 to 50% of GAs, um, which seems like an awful lot, but this is, this is what the data says. Um, whereas the average in EASTIS elsewhere in the region is using TIVA for about half that. Um, and interestingly, that's you know, in comparison to NAP5, which was only 2014, so it was only four years ago, suggested that only 8% of GAs nationally are TIVA. So we're using five times that rate at NUH now. Um, I don't know if that represents an increased use everywhere, and we're just well ahead of the curve, um, or what. Um, so, moving on, I wanted to know how people were using TIVA. So the first, the first CEDA Association guideline recommendation was that we should be trained to do what we're doing, and that people should have the knowledge and skills required to actually deliver TIVA competently and safely. Um, and I asked if people felt they were being trained, and again, people here feel that they are competent to do it. Um, less so elsewhere, but again, this is, uh, this is all comers. So some of the people in the East Midlands who say they don't feel competent to use it probably aren't using it. Um, so when general anesthesia is to be maintained by propofol, use of TCI is recommended. And again, we're doing that without exception, according to the survey response. And there are places in the East Midlands where people are using a TIVA technique without using TCI, um, but not many. Um, I was interested in what people were doing with Remy, but this isn't part of the guideline. I was just interested. And again, it looks like the majority of TIVA techniques being used at MUH are TCI Propofol, TCI Remy. And that's probably true in the rest of the East Midlands as well, but perhaps less so. Um, so, within an anaesthetic department, it's preferable to stock only one concentration of Propofol and to dilute Remy to a single standard concentration. What I asked was, does your usual area stop more than one concentration of propofol? And apparently we do. And I don't know if anyone can tell me where this is, because I haven't seen 2% propofol at NUH in cardiac. There we go. There's the answer. And, and you're not changing. And you're not changing. Well, again, <laughs> and again, and again, the CEDA and Association guidelines would suggest that having two different concentrations of propofol next to each other in a cupboard is not a good idea. Um, we don't have one. So. That's fine, though. Okay. All right. So your usual clinical area doesn't stop more than one concentration of propofol. And the answer still no. Um, <laughs> lovely. So um, the infusion set through which you deliver your TIVA should be a dedicated TIVA giving set. Features lower lots at both ends, um, along with anti-reflux and anti-siphon valves. So what I asked was, 
use of a dedicated infusion set featuring Lurilox at each end, anti-reflux, anti-siphon valves. And again, at NUH, I think every almost everyone, 99% are using the dedicated purchased TIVA-specific giving sets, which is fantastic. That there are places in the East Midlands where they may be doing that and they don't realize that's what they're doing, or they may genuinely be cobbling something together using different kind of curly whirly wires. Um, so again, thus far, we're doing pretty well. Um, infusion pumps should be programmed only after the syringe containing the drug has been placed in the pump. Now, this isn't something I did until I read the guideline. So I would have been one of the people who said no, but it looks like I'm in good company because almost a quarter of the department aren't program or are more than happy to program their pumps without the drug being in the pump. And this is one area in which the East Midlands reports itself as being better than us. So we are roughly twice as likely to program our pumps without a drug in them. And that's a, an interesting thing to remember because there's something else later on that we do twice as often as well. And this may go some way towards explaining it. Um, so the intravenous cannula or catheter through which the infusion is being delivered should be visible throughout surprised me a great deal. So only 70% of us are doing this. And again, I phrased the question with, if practical to do so, which is a direct copy of the wording of the guideline. So I'm not asking people to do anything interesting. If it would be practical to see your cannula, can you see your cannula? And 29% of people say no. And I, that really genuinely surprised me. Um, so the other thing, a few of the other guidelines relate to training. So anaesthetists should be familiar with the principles, interpretation, and limitations of processed EEG. Um, have you received training in the use of infusion pumps for processed EEG monitors for TIVA in your organization? Thanks to Rob, we've had the BIS um, rep out um, within the month before I sent out the survey. So we were all feeling very, very trained at this point. <laughs> no, that's brilliant though, because again, <laughs> I wonder what we would have said have I sent the survey out a month earlier before we'd all have the opportunity to have a chat with the BIS rep? Um, so number nine, use of processed EEG monitoring is recommended when a neuromuscular blocking drug is used with TIVA. So I asked, is your usual practice to use processed EEG when using TIVA? Always, only with neuromuscular blockade, never or other. And the majority of us are using it always. So not just with neuromuscular blockade, we are using it regardless. We're using it whenever we use TIVA, which is my practice as well. Um, and you compare that with the rest of the region, and the rest of the region, again, 45% are using it all the time, but there's a significantly greater number only using it with neuromuscular blockade, which is what the guideline says. And there's a significantly greater number who are never using processed EEG at all. Um, interestingly, a lot of the others that cropped up for the rest of the region were people who were saying, I wish I could use it, but we don't have enough kit. Um, so, uh, recommendations three and 10 from the guideline are there for completeness. <laughs> Um, but I didn't include them in my survey. So, um, assuming we have a representative sample, NUH practice is mostly as good or better than the rest of the region, except we're quite happy to hide our cannulas, um, perhaps, and we program empty pumps more often than the rest of the region. And as I say, we use more BIS, more, see, I've forgotten I'd use the word deviance on that slide, I like that. Um, <laughs> uh, we, use, we use more BIS, we use more TCI for Remy, um, and that may be in part because as a heavy using department, we've got much better availability of kit. So we're, we're more able to say we want to use a second TCI pump for Remy than the rest of the region. We may be more able to use BIS when we want to because we physically got a lot more you know, drip stands of shame. <laughs> um, so. The next thing, which is the bit that I actually really wanted to get to, um, is how many errors are we making? How many errors are we making? How many errors are the rest of the region making? Is this, are some of these things common? Are they rare? Um, am I making more errors than the rest of my colleagues and the rest of the region? Um, so the way I phrase this is when using TIVA, have you made or witnessed the following errors or issues? Please select all that apply and please be honest. Um, so fairly open, I hope, to, I hope to catch as many, but I did say, have you made or witnessed? So I was hoping for who have directly seen these things rather than just heard about them on the grapevine. I appreciate I may have gotten some heard upon the grapevine kind of responses, but. Um, so drug preparation errors are issues, incorrect <coughs> concentration of drug, not common, but has happened. Um, drugs not present in the infusion, so Remy not added to the Remy fentanyl syringe. I've done this um, and it seems we do, we have done this more at NUH than elsewhere, but still not one of the more common errors that occurred. Um, uh, drugs or giving set for previous patients connected to a subsequent patient, fortunately rare. Prompt misprogrammed, so incorrect patient demographics, 25 to 30%. Um, 
pump misprogrammed, i.e. the correct drug but the incorrect protocol, somewhere between 15 and 20% of people have either done that or witnessed it directly. Um, previous patient demographics not cleared, that's fortunately not that common. And the most common error by a mile, if you can consider it an error, and I think you probably can, um, is your pump's dying. And again, it's happening to us and the rest of the East Midlands fairly comparably, so about 50% of people who use TIVA have done this. Um, so other things, set up or giving set errors or issues, so infusion not primed, infusion set not connected, infusion set with the drugs reflu refluxing into the giving set of connected fluids or siphoning down, which should be impossible with the right kit. Um, however, protocol drug mismatching, i.e. my error, protocol and Remy, the wrong way up in the pumps. You remember I said before there was something we were doing twice as often as the rest of the region, and there was something else that we do twice as often as the rest of the region, and I wondered if that might be an explanation. We are more than twice as likely, if the data is correct, to make this error than the rest of the East Midlands, and we're more than twice as likely to program our pumps without the drugs in them. So that is one thing that perhaps we all need to consider if that's your practice, um, maybe you're making yourself more likely to do that. Does that make sense? Well um, so cannular errors, we're all aware that cannulas fail, and that's one of the reasons why your TIVA may not work. Um, and again, unsurprisingly, somewhere between 25 and a third of the time, a third of people have witnessed cannula failure at induction, and comparable for patients, people who've uh, had their cannula fail in theatre. Um, so there's a list of the most common errors that I found, um, pump battery failure being at the top, but there's quite a few that have happened to more than 20% of people surveyed. So there are quite a few things that have happened to more than just me. Um, but another thing to be very wary of is obviously these are percentage of respondents, not percentage of TIVA cases. <laughs> and so the next thing was, as a result of any of these errors, has anything happened to your patient? Um, so having your patient deeper than you intended to be, 20 to 25% of people said that's happened to them as a result of an error or issue. So that's not because I'm using TIVA and I'm not good at it. That's because something has gone awry and I've not done what I intended to do. 20 to 25% of people have had a patient deeper than they intended, and that has caused hypotension bradycardia in a smaller number, but still a number. Um, conversion to an alternate means of providing anesthesia has happened to about 25% of people who use TIVA. So other consequences, about 25% of people have had someone lighter than they intended. A smaller number have had someone light enough that they were hypertensive or tachycardic with potential for harm. But three people, one here and two in the rest of the East Midlands, reported accidental awareness during anaesthesia. But it is plausible that failure to ensure delivery of your intended dose may result in failure to achieve your intended depth. And that possibly has resulted in awareness in our region. Um, um, wherever a road and a railway line meet, there is the potential for a collision. And the likelihood of a collision kind of depends on how many trains there are and how many cars there are. So at places where level crossings are in more built up areas where there are more cars, they put flashing lights, road markings and barriers. And the barriers come down and therefore ideally prevent cars being on the train track when the train comes past. However, they cause delay, they still require vigilance to use and if you were particularly inclined to, you could ignore the barrier, crash through the barrier or drive around the barrier and put your car on the train track. They still require vigilance. There is still scope for a user to cause a collision. And I think this is the equivalent of what we do with Stop Before You Block and the WHO checklists. They work if you use them, but there are ways of negotiating around them. And perhaps what we need are not barriers on level crossings. What you actually need if you've got a road and a railway line meeting each other is a bridge. You need something that is designed to make it impossible for you to make that error. The nice thing about bridges is you don't have to think about them. You drive underneath the train, the train goes over the top. They require no road user vigilance to prevent you crashing into the train. You'd have to work very hard to crash into the train. Um, bridges prevent error during normal circumstances and they don't require vigilance to work. And they don't cause undue delays. Because human beings are fallible, good systems need to be very robust. And whether we re recognize it or not, we're used to dealing with those types of patient safety initiatives all the time. Over multiple iterations of anesthetic machines, we have made it very difficult to do anything other than that which we intended to do when providing a volatile anesthetic. So we've got, 
a whole manner of things built in that we make people learn for the primary so they can reel off all of these ways in which your machine makes you a safer practitioner. However, the Tiva, we've got two pumps that look identical and a giving set. And they require programming before every case. They'll do exactly what you tell them to do, even when it's silly. You have to do new drug dilution and preparation before every single case. And in my opinion, the reason why, I'm, you, why you're seeing more error with Tiva than you would do with a volatile anesthetic is because the current equipment for Tiva is under-engineered. Um, many, many, many errors are not prevented by the kit, as demonstrated by the survey, because we've made them. And therefore, they become likely to occur, especially as we use more Tiva. And we are using more Tiva. And the region is using more Tiva. The level crossing is getting busier. The likelihood of someone navigating the barrier gets higher. Um, so what I think the solution to this is, personally, would be something that made it very difficult for, make, for us to make some of these errors. It would be something involving industry that, prevent, that means you cannot put propofol in the Remy pump because they are physically incompatible with each other. And you would require something like you know, risk code, wristband barcode programming of the pumps so that you don't have to put in the demographics. So there is no way you can misenter your patient details. However, all of these things cost money and are far longer term solutions. So until then, it would probably be sensible if we at least tried to put some kind of barrier across the level crossing, um, which is where my potential solution comes in. I don't everyone grow it at once. Um, <laughs> um, so <laughs> obviously very inspired by stop before you block and obviously very limited to people's <coughs> compliance with it. So if people want to do this, this is now what I do. And this is what I've been doing whenever I use Tiva for the last couple of months. Um, my ODPs are initially entertained by the idea and slightly bemused that I want to do something else different. Um, and then once they get on board with it, they see it like stop before you block or like the WHO checklist. It just becomes part of your normal practice. Um, so it's intended to be done immediately before you press go on the pump. So either during pre-oxygenation or if you're like me and you start them on a little bit of Remy or a bit of propofol before pre-oxygenation is done then. Ideally, it should be done after the WHO checklist, when everything else is ready, when all the monitoring is on, when all the distractions are done, at the point immediately before you press go, just like stop before you block. Um, and it should be a two-person verb thing spoken out loud because then you know you've actually done it. And unless everything is correct, don't start the infusions. Um, and just if anyone wants to time it, if anyone's got a second hand on the clock, this is how long it actually takes to do. So propofol, press more on both pumps. Propofol should be the upper pump. Is the propofol syringe, the white medicine, in the syringe that's programmed for propofol? And is that the model you wanted to use? Have you got an empty Remy fentanyl ampule suggesting that there is Remy in your Remy syringe? Is it the correct number of milligrams for the dilution that you've done? Is your Remy in the lower pump is your Remy syringe in the Remy program? Are your user settings this patient and do they match each other? Is your giving set connected at both ends and is your drip running? And your drip running is your test of the cannula at induction. And electricity, do the pumps have adequate charge? Do you have charging cables in theater waiting to plug them into when you go in? And if anyone was timing that, I think it takes about 30 seconds. 45. <laughs> I think I'd said less than 60. On the, uh, there you go. I'm less than 60 on the next slide. So this is what I do. I have found this helpful. Obviously, if people wish to use it, I'd be delighted if they did. Um, it solves the six most common errors that were identified in the survey. Um, and in a similar way, even if uptake isn't everyone, and even if everyone's practice using it isn't perfect, it will still reduce your own personal error rate, I think. Um, if you were someone who was likely to make any of these errors. And I think one of the problems with TIVA is you, you make your error and then your practice to avoid that error becomes brilliant and you don't see the train coming from the other direction. Um, so error when using TIVA is probably common, um, but we're not reporting our errors. So I added this after the last talk. Report your errors and then we'll know how common it is. But it's not a single error issue. Um, Stop hiding your cannulas, stop programming empty pumps because that's something we do worse than the rest of the Midlands. Don't forget to plug the pumps in. However, vigilance will only take you so far. Maybe until there are some industry standards to make error more difficult, maybe we need to peruse before we infuse. And that's me done. <laughs>